to Hosea chapter 10. All right, Hosea chapter 10, let's pray. Father, thank you for there being joy in the house of the Lord and that you desire that we would uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness and holiness and purity in our lives. And God, I would pray tonight that as we are primarily learning from this book of Hosea and from a backslidden Israel of what not to do, I, I pray that you would teach us some things to do tonight as well. This is an extremely applicational book of the Bible, and we would pray that uh, these precious people that you brought here tonight would hear the voice of their God. Amen. 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 Turn your Bibles to Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. Go. Think you can do it real quick? In Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, King David is pouring out his heart to the Lord after he's what? Do you remember what's going on there? He gets popped by, what's the guy's Nathan, yep, he gets bought by Nathan for his little fling there with Bathsheba and says what? Thou art the, thou art the man. I've learned so much from reading and rereading these chapters, specifically the wisdom that King David shares in Psalm 32, verse 5. Read it with me. It says, I acknowledged my sin to you. Everybody, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. Selah. And you know what Selah means? It just means to pause and to meditate. God has forgiven our iniquity. Hmm. That is, that is, that's amazing. Here's the deal. God saw it all and was still willing to forgive. He was just waiting for the king, for King David to be honest and find freedom in being truthful, freedom from personal condemnation and freedom from the penalty of our iniquity. The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in, in Christ Jesus our Lord, right? David understood, wrote in Psalm 103, that he has separated our sins what? As far as... East is from west. That's incredible. I just, we, serve a good, we serve a good God. Amen. Look at somebody and say, we serve a good God. We serve a good God. Now, my mind, my mind has always been a little bit boggled how some people know they're guilting, guilty and yet brazenly and arrogantly refuse to admit it. You ever, you ever met somebody like that? You ever, why are you looking at me? Yeah, I know. I know yeah. You ever met somebody like that? They, they know that they've done wrong, but they brazenly and arrogantly refuse to admit it. Like the guy, this guy, uh, he's, he's ripping off a jewelry store, ripping off a jewelry store, and, and uh, he gets arrested. He's on trial, and after the jurors deliberate, the jury foreman makes the announcement, not guilty. And immediately the defendant says, does that mean I get to keep the diamonds? He knew. I didn't say it was going to be great, but it makes you think, right? Guy was obviously guilty as charged, but what? He had no remorse. No remorse because he thought he had what? He thought he had, he thought he got, yeah, he thought he got away with it. Same thing with a burglar who goes to the psychiatrist and says, uh, I feel so bad every time. I rob somebody's house, and the psychiatrist look back, looks back at him and, and says, well, well, I suppose, I suppose you're here, you're here uh, for me to help you to walk away from this life of crime. And the thief says, nope, I want you to help me not feel bad about my stealing. That wasn't even a courtesy laugh. I heard that one out there. Oh, my goodness. 
Here's the deal. Some people, even when they're busted red-handed, still proclaim their innocence. And once again, that's where we find Israel here in Hosea 10. Somehow, they choose to remain blinded, and they won't fess up to their spiritual adultery. And what happens when we don't fess up? We force God to bring what? Yeah, correction, instruction, judgment. And again, we're going to hear him say to these people, these people that he loves, he's going to say guilty as charged. Now, time frame, time frame of the book of Hosea takes place between 753 and 713 B.C., about uh, 200 years after the establishment of the divided kingdom and about uh, 10 years It's going to be 10 years in, into, into the Assyrian captivity, and most of you understand just how heinous that's going to be, where they get hooks put in their jaws, and they're, and, they're, and they're let off in chains simply, simply because they chose not to repent. Now, now during this time, outwardly, Israel is very prosperous. Inwardly, the nation is rebellious. And they're not only rebellious, they're rebellious against the God who made them prosperous. Do you, ever, do you ever just walk around your house and thank God for the little things that you never think about? I, I'm, I'm sure at times you've probably thanked Him for the house that you're in, maybe once or twice. I encourage you to do it all the time. But do you th thank Him for your family? Do you thank Him for the little things? You ever thank him for your Triscuits? One little $2.50 box of Triscuits that he doesn't have to give you, and yet he does. Do you ever, I mean, I'm talking about the simple things. So many things that we take for granted, and I try to tell people all the time, just get in the habit of not thanking God and watch him take your stuff away to get your attention because he has a right to do that. So, so you think about Israel. It's at a very prosperous point. Uh, historically, God has blessed them incredibly, and yet they have forgotten, they have chosen to forget to not regularly be thanking God for that. And I, I just think of our country. Our country is spiraling, spiraling out of control like never before. You know, I, I don't have time to go every, through everything on a Sunday morning, and that's where I'm, I'm working in our verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Revelation. I'm trying to add some prophecy update stuff in there. But our country could go broke before the 2024 elections. I know that you don't think, you, you, nobody wants to think that. But if you do a little research and you listen to the things that I'm telling you on Sunday mornings, you better be filing that in long-term memory and start making adjustments now because anybody thinking that this is ever going to get any better is completely wrong. And, and we just need to be prepared for it. And you need to be preparing your children for it. Uh, as well. And what a great time to be sharing the gospel with people because people are worried. Stock market, 4,000 points in a couple of months. People, I know you young people, it means nothing to you, but for us old people that have been putting money into our 401ks for years and losing 25 or 30 percent of that in six months, uh, the that's the kind of stuff that hurts. And um, other people that don't have any, it, it just, it's just a, a crazy time to be alive. So just make sure your house is in order. Because if all that stuff is coming down, guess who else is coming down? We're going to meet him in the air forever to be with the Lord. So um, we've discovered a lot of parallels here between the nation of Israel and, uh, well, 
rebellious Israel and rebellious America. And that's one of the reasons why we're studying this book and prayerfully to alert those professing believers that are headed in the same direction as Israel was. Because remember this, Israel hasn't completely forsaken God. They're just worshiping other gods along with him. And how do you think God feels about that? He's, no, it doesn't make him happy. It doesn't make him, make him happy at all. And that's, that's, why, that's why they're going into this downward spiral. And, uh, and we as Christians, we, 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 we just need to learn from that. It's not a time. This is not a time to be compromising. This is not a time to be putting anything first before your relationship with the Lord. And uh, uh, some people spiral downward and they never come back up. And so that's why you want to stay hot for the Lord. Remember what Jesus said in uh, uh, Revelation 2. He said that I want, them, I want them hot or cold. They're lukewarm, what? I'm going to spit them out of my mouth. And the, the, I think there's a lot of people that are professing to know Jesus that are going to experience uh, just that. And you have the opportunity to warn them. And I mean warn them. Grab them by the shoulders and wake them up and say, you're not walking with the Lord, I fear for your soul. Look at your lives. Look at all these things that are taking priority over the things of God. How do you think Israel started? That's how backsliding starts, a little at a time. The devil is very wise. You know, it's that, it's, uh, I was just over talking to Janice in the ministry, and, and, uh, and, you know, last week we had uh, a whole wing full of kids. And now Awana stops, and there's not a wing full of kids over there. And I, I've been telling people, don't take the summer off, man. Don't take the summer off. Well, here's the deal. Take the summer off, but how would you expect God to bless you when you're taking time away from Him? Taking off away from Him and being around His people and staying under the teaching of His Word. So uh, just don't be one of those peeps. So the Lord has called Hosea to be a living 40 year. 40-year sermon illustration, calling him to marry a harlot, remember a hooker, what's her name? Gomer, right? Gomer, knowing that uh, this was not on his bucket list for sure, God calls Hosea to marry Gomer, and, and all the while, God knows that she is going to cheat on Hosea, and her unholy hanky-panky leads to her conceiving what? Two other babies by other two other baby daddies, and, uh, and this is to testify to the broken heart that God has because Israel, his betrothed, is doing the same spiritual, right, spiritual hanky-panky uh, and getting all frisky with the false gods of, uh, of Canaan. Exactly. And I often wonder how... How did Israel get to this point? Did God not warn them? Read through the book of Exodus. Read through the book of Numbers. Read through the book of Deuteronomy. He warned them over and over and over that when you come into this promised land that I am giving you, don't chase after the gods of the pagans. And what have they done? Same thing, and you look at Christians today. They do the same. They're chasing after the things of the world instead of chasing after the things of God. So that's why this is such a, a great, relevant, applicational book for all of us. And uh, I just encourage you to take this kind of stuff seriously, especially knowing that trumpet's going to blow. Man, it's got to be blowing at any moment. I listen to a lot of other prophecy updates, and these guys are saying it. It can't be long. I mean, it can't be long. It just can't be long. So just have your house in order. As for me and my house, what? We will, we will serve the Lord. Now, now, the relevance to us in our walks of the Lord is to reinforce that sin is spiritual adultery. And sin is anything that we think, say, or do that what? Displeases God. And to him who knows the good that he ought to do and not to do it to him or to her, it is what? Yeah. Yeah, it's sin. Our relationship with the Lord needs to be seen the same way man sees the human marriage vows. 
God is saying when we spiritually sin against him, the visual is when a man or a woman leaves their spouse to have sex with someone else. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a crude picture, but that's the picture that God is painting in his word because he wants us to realize that, that it's a violation of trust and a violation of spiritual intimacy. And they have replaced fidelity and loyalty with adultery and idolatry. And as, as God has exposed Israel's spiritual adultery, he will do. He will do the same thing with any professing believer who has left their first love. And here's something to write down. Here's your question to be writing down. This is just between you and the Lord. Is there, has there been a point in my life when I have been hotter for the Lord than I am right now? How about writing that one down? You going to write that one down? I'm waiting. Has there been a point in my life, in my Christian walk with the Lord, where I have been hotter for the things of God than I am right now? Because if there is, guess what? Nobody stays neutral in their relationship with the Lord. You're either going forward or you're what? Or you're going backwards. Next, uh, uh, next uh, chapter, God is going to say that my people, Israel, are bent on backsliding. Bent on that. That's what I'll discuss that more next week, but they're bent on backsliding. And, and uh, the Bible says that, that, that what we read about here in the Old Testament is for our, for our benefit so we don't make the same mistakes. So just choose Jesus as your first love and leave him there. Don't let anything get in the way. Anything get in the way of that. Now, the entirety of Hosea reveals the Lord contrasting his, his unrelenting love for Israel with Israel's unreliable love for him. And with all of that very direct truth in, in calling out his people and the, the judgment their continued sin has earned them, God still gives a glimpse of a coming day when, when the, these people, Israel, is frozen chosen at this time, will turn to their God in love and faithfulness, which that's just simply what, what God had been desiring from the beginning. And as we get rolling tonight, remember, this is written as a single document. It's not broken up. It's not broken up into uh, to chapters and verses. So to make sure uh, we understand the seriousness of what's going on here. I want you to look at the last verse. Look at chapter 9, verse 17, where God is continuing to give reproof to his wayward wife. And let's see if, uh, let's see if they'll listen. Look at, verse, look at verse 17. It says, My God will cast them away because they, what? Did not obey him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. It's not very uh, politically correct today, but there's a, there's a plant called the wandering Jew. Yeah, the wandering Jew, because the plant grows in, in all directions. There's some legends about the plant being named because a, uh, a man in Israel mocked Jesus on the way to the cross and received a, a curse that his soul would wander the earth. Yet the, the origin of it, it, its name comes from the fact that, that God, God has forced the Jews to wander many times. Remember what happened in Exodus? Remember what happened when they left Egypt? It's like an 11-day straight shot walk from where they were in, in northern Egypt to the very tip of the bottom of, of, uh, of what we know as Israel now, to the bottom of Canaan. And how long did they walk in the desert? 40 years. 40 years. Sometimes walking in circles. And, and so just understand, he'll let people wander in hopes that they'll get their life right with the Lord. And if not, they will die in the desert while they're wandering. He allowed them to wander because of their unfaithfulness. And, and uh, 
We force God to make us wander at times to get our attention just so that we would look back at him. And, and... Well, look at the person next to you and say, I don't want to be a wandering Christian. I do not want to be a wandering Christian. All right, look at verse 1. Chapter 10 of the book of Hosea. It says, Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars according to the bounty of his land. They have embellished his sacred pillars. What he is saying here is that they've increased food for themselves, not for the sacrifices of God. And they give honor to pagan gods for the harvest by building what? More altars. More altars to these false gods. I try to explain the wisdom of, of verbally thanking God for every good thing that you have, because if not, he, does He have every right to take it from you? When was the last time that you thought that God might want to take some things away from you. I think about it all the time. That's why I, that's why I just try to be, I give thanks with a grateful, right? With a grateful. I'm not going to try and sing it out loud. Okay. Oh, I just did. My bad. Hmm. God sees that Israel is using the wealth and prosperity that he had given them to use that in worship of false gods. Thus, he calls them out for having what? What kind of a heart? What kind of a heart? A divided heart, right? A divided heart. Did you say that right there? Yeah. A divided, a divided heart. Now, um... Do you ever think about what you spend your money on? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about if it honors God or not? I mean, I, I don't think that God's a killjoy. I think that he allows us to spend some, some of his money on stuff that is just because it brings us joy, because I think it brings God joy when we have joy. And, and uh, so you don't want to get all legalistic about, about that kind of stuff. But there's some people that just waste a whole lot of money. That's why these people have a divided heart, and that's why God is calling them out on this divided heart, and He's basically passing a sentence saying, guilty, guilty as charge. And God gives some people wealth because they know, because He knows He's created them to be able to handle it, but most people like it when they win the lottery, it's gone in five years, and then they're bankrupt or they're broke or they're broke again because they can't, they can't handle money. And it seems like, like people who God has given wealth to often spend it on really, on really dumb things. Um, let me ask you a question. How many, of you, how many of you would buy a statue of Adolf Hitler? Not today. Buy a statue of, hey, yesterday? Day before? Okay, yeah. Statue of Adolf Hitler. Nobody would, right? Well, somebody did. Somebody did, and they paid $17 million dollars for it. There's the article. Some, uh, some billionaire is giving a tour of his mansion and says, now let me show you one of my favorite pieces of, of art. And they walk in a room and see a wax Hitler. What a waste. What a waste of money. Speaking of waste of money, let's talk about cats. <laughs> Not that, listen, hear, hear me out. Not that cats, not that cats are a waste of money because, the, 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 well, most people don't buy their cats, right? Most people don't buy their cats. They just find them meowing outside their front door, you know, because their owner kicked them out. Usually that's what happens. So being the kind soul. Who are the cat people? I just want to know who I'm offending tonight. Good, all right. Um, so, so. So being the kind, right, being the kind soul that you are, you bring them, right? You bring them. How many of you ever had a, just a stray cat? You found a stray cat and you've kept them, okay? Okay? I know, I know that happens. That happens a lot. Um, you invite them into the house and, 
they quickly begin to rule and dominate your entire, your t- entire home. Now, now, you guys know, I hope you know that when, I'm, when I talk about cats or when I talk about little dogs, I'm just joking around. I'm just yanking your chain. I like, I like all animals, almost all animals. Oh, yeah, yeah, most animals, most animals. Um, I, I, no, here, I, to prove it, I love your little fur balls, right? As long as they're not one of those mean, stuck-up, you know, super spoiled cats, that people spend way too much money on. You aren't any of those people, right? Okay, all right. And by spoiled, I mean, um, mark this on your list of why third world countries hate America. Fancy Feast has appetizers for your cat. Appetizers for your cat. Light meat tuna appetizer with a scallop topper in a delicate broth. Maybe I'm just jealous because I don't eat that good. <laughs> Maybe that's the case. Appetizers for your cat. Mr. Whiskers, before we serve you your main course of Alaska salmon, turkey, chicken, liver, and tofu, would you like an appetizer of a light meat tuna with a scallop, to- uh, scallop topper and a delicate broth to coat your palate? Appetizers for a cat. I'm, don't raise your hands. I don't want to know. If you buy appetizers for your cats, I, I don't, I, I don't want to know. But this I do know. Those little tabbies and tomcats are going to eat whatever you give them. When I had my Rottweilers, you know, I used to buy them expensive dog food. And then I got saved. <laughs> and my budget went way, way down. And I realized that they ate the Alpo just as much as they ate the Imes at half the price. At half the price, so, you know, also, just for your little heads up, um, they, won't, they will eat whatever you put down there. They're not going to starve, and, and from what I hear, mice are still free. So, they're, they're still going to live. They're still going to live, right? Here's my point. It's not to make cat lovers hate me even more. My point is, just be cautious on how you spend the Lord's, the Lord's money because it's him who's given it to us, and we are stewards of that. And, and just, just give him thanks. Play it safe. Just give him thanks for everything. Look at verse 2. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. Like I mentioned earlier, they haven't left God completely. They're simply divided in heart. They're still going through the motions of saying they love God, but they also love the gods of the Canaanites. Try that with your spouse. How's that going to work out? Try that, try that with your spouse. Well, baby, I still love you, but I love this gal down the street uh, too. That's fine with you, isn't it? Oh, yes, dear, that's, that's, that's completely fine. Why don't you go take a nap while I pack your things? right? And you would have a right to do that. Husbands, you better not have a divided heart on your wife. And your wives better not have a divided heart on your husband. And even more important than that, we can't have a divided heart on on our God, right? I try to graciously explain to people all the time that if Jesus isn't our first love, he sees our relationship as invalid. And a lot of people don't understand that, but that's because they don't read their Bibles. If you love me, what? Keep my, keep my commands. And no one can serve what? Two masters. And you, that's not just money. It's anything. You can't, serve, you can't serve your spouse and serve God. You can't serve your job and serve God. You can't serve your ministry and serve God. You have to serve God first. Now, notice that... Uh, God has no problem calling out Israel on their sin. And he says what? Guilty as charged. How do you respond, my brothers, my sisters? How do you respond when God says to you or to me, guilty as charged? How do you respond? Do you fight him on it? I know we've all tried to do that. It doesn't work out very well. That's not the thing that we should... uh, 
that we should be doing. When he says guilty is charged, we just need to do what? Do you fess up or do you continue to mess up and continue to pretend that God doesn't see? What you know that he does see. Uh, There's no escape. There's no escape when God says guilty as charge. And the best thing that we can do is to confess our sin and trust in God's promise. You know God's promise in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, what? God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is a sign of maturity to admit when you're wrong. It is a sign of immaturity to not admit when you're wrong. You just, what I do, I just simply throw myself on the mercy of the court, mercy of God's court when he busts me on something. Hmm. And on that topic of of, uh, hmm. admitting and throwing yourself on the mercy of of the court, a a while back there's a a man in Nigeria and he steals a ram. Not one of these, one of these. Steals one of these rams. Apparently it was a crime. It was a crime of opportunity. So he swipes the ram and when he tries to when he tries to sell it, he actually ends up in a, in a cell. Now, he did plead guilty, but he pulled a Geraldine. You young people won't understand what that is, but he pulled a Geraldine. He says, the devil. The devil made me do it. He blamed it on the devil. That's what it is right there. Can you see that? He blames it. He blames it on the devil. Now, here's the deal. I think in most crimes, I think the devil, the devil is probably, is probably involved, but he's not always the trigger man. Sometimes it's just our bad heart. He just comes along and, and, uh, and fuels it. So with the Lord, we can't pull, you know, the devil made me do it card, because guess who knows the truth? I think that he does. Do you think he does? I think he does. Sometimes we need just to follow the example of the snake that appeared before the judge and pled guilty. You know why he did? Because he didn't have a leg to stand on. Get it? Get it? it? You knew where I was going, huh? It's a dad joke right there. Total dad joke right now. Just like he knew that uh, Israel, Israel was guilty as charged, not having a leg to stand on, he knows when we have a divided heart. And if we force him to, he will tear down the sacred pillars and the altars, the foreign gods that we have built in hopes that that will get our attention and we will turn, we will turn back to him. Look at verse 3. It says, now they say, we have no king because we did not fear the Lord. Is that underlined in your Bibles? Because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? Under the time of Hosea's prophesying, they had four of their kings assassinated by family members. That's why the call out of we have no king, yet the important statement is that they know why they have no legitimate king. Why is that? Because they didn't fear the Lord. It's because they didn't fear God. One of the factors that always concerns me when I witness to people is that they will go to hell knowing how to get to heaven. That breaks my heart. Look at verse 4. They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. Now, we're going to hear more about furrows in in a few verses, but most of you know this, you know, me growing up on the farm. I know, I know that furrows are graded rows, graded rows we plant seeds in to grow our... uh, Rutabagas. You ever grown rutabagas, Dave? Mm-mm. Neither have I. I hate them. Okay. Rutabagas. Dandelions. What? Dandelions. Dandelions? Those, are Those are easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are easy. Don't have to do a thing. <laughs> and here, instead, we're, uh, we're, we're told, uh, instead of a crop of rutabagas, what springs up? What does it say springs up? Hemlock. Hemlock springs up. What is hemlock? 
It's a poison, right? It's a poisonous plant. It's what Socrates used to commit suicide with. They've spoken words. And, and I want you to go back. Look, look, at, look at those, in verse 4, let those first 19 letters sink in. God remembers our words, and specifically here, the swearing and making a false covenant. What do you call it when somebody says something false? Yeah, it's called a lie. And before we get too hard on Israel, what about us? Hmm. You ever lied to God? Oh. Don't even, we don't even like to think about it, do we? Isn't God merciful? His mercy endures forever. God remembers the words that we said when we gave our hearts to Him. He remembers that we said that we would love Him with what? All our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He remembers when He proposed to us that we said, I do. He remembers when we said we would forsake all others. Freshly married couple, remember we just did that in your vows. Six days ago, right? Forsaking all others and cleaving only to one person. He remembers when we said that Jesus will be our first love no matter what. And he remembers that he forced no one to make a covenant with him. You know, we live in an age where most people don't have a conscience when it comes to lying. You ever met anybody who lies? You ever met anybody who lies? You ever met Christians who lie? Oh, my goodness. Christians and lie? That, those two should not go together. Look at these headlines. I have a couple of headlines here for you. Um, let's see. 60% of people can't go 10 minutes without lying. 60% of people. That's 6 out of 10. One, two, three, four, five, six. Liars. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Liars. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, just, I mean, just hopefully that number is lower here in the church of God. 60%. And then there's that other headline that says, people lie, some people lie as easily as they breathe. Now, we expect this type of behavior in the world. That's what people without Jesus do. Why do so many politicians lie? Because most of them are what? Without Jesus. Without Jesus. Why do so many news people lie? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit inside them convicting them. But they do have what? That's right. They do. They have a conscience. They have a conscience. But it be, it be, in, in Romans it says that it can become seared with a what? Hot iron can be seared with a, with a hot iron. And lying becomes as easy as breathing. And they, they sleep just fine. Does it bother you when you lie to somebody? Is it hard to sleep? Oh, my goodness. It should be. It should be. Not knowing or not believing that God says all liars, all liars will what? Have their place in the... In the lake of fire. That, you like being lied to? No. You've been lied to? Yeah. Yeah. What happens to that relationship with that person once they lie to you? Even though you're supposed to forgive, right? Right? Even though it's a command to forgive, right? Is it hard to trust that person again? Yeah, it certainly is. It certainly is. And, and even it, it slowly degrades into a non-relationship. And that person just becomes an acquaintance. You ever had friends? Good friends. People that you were close to. They lied to you. And now you just feel uncomfortable around them. Because it's like the elephant in the room. I know you lied to me. You know you lied to me. But yet you won't repent of those lies. You won't apologize. 
It'll, it just, um, you know, it's hard, isn't it? I, you know, I, I, know that, I know that we're supposed to forgive, and I, I know that we do. You can forgive, but it certainly is hard to forget. And if somebody violates your trust, it, it's, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to get that back. It's hard to get that back. Um, just like lying has become acceptable with worldly people, some Christians adopt that same strategy, which is incredibly foolish because God knows that we know that He knows the truth, and He knows that we're lying. Why do we lie? Leave it to Dr. Phil to give us the answers, right? Because Dr. Phil, yeah. I think it's better to trust Dr. Jesus, but Dr. Phil gives these reasons. And, uh, and like I said, I think he got these reasons from Dr. Jesus. Number one, to escape accountability. That's why we, that's why we continue to lie, or that's why we don't repent of our lie. And to avoid punishment. Or to take what is rightfully not theirs, right? Politicians do that kind of stuff all the time. I don't know who to trust anymore. I don't know. When I turn on the news, I don't know who to trust anymore. Another reason to inflict pain. Number five, to steal admiration. Having someone think you're something that you're not. That's kind of what Jesus said. Eh, you're doing your good works before man. Right? That's why the, the Pharisees would go and pray, right, on all four corners in every direction. Eh, you've done your works before man. There's no, there's no treasure for you. But you go in what? your secret place and close the door for God sees what goes on in secret. Here's a, here's a question for you. Is concealing information a lie? How many of you have had to drag things out of your kids, right? You ask them a question, there's a very simple answer, and they dodge it or they say, but, but this or... Is that, is that still lying? If they, yeah, of course it is. Concealing information is a lie when you know that you should share. Is it a lie to share partial truth? Yeah, of course it is. Is it a lie when you said you would do something and you don't do it? Is it? And we don't want to pass up to that kind of stuff because we know that we've all done it, right? You know, but, but Christians are supposed to stand out here. We're not supposed to meld in with the rest of the world because 60% of the world can do it, can't go 10 minutes, right? And they can do it as easily, some of them can, can, can do it as easily as breathing. But for the Christian, that just hardens your heart and it sears your conscience until you no longer, it, it doesn't bother you anymore. And it's hard to get back from that point of no return. Um, my encouragement, knowing we're, we're going to stand before the Lord. The Bible says in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 10, uh, that we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account for every careless word. Can you imagine how many lies, what, what it means if we're going to have to stand before the Lord for our lies or the times that we didn't tell the truth? So I'm just trying to encourage you, don't blend in with the world. Tell the truth, even when it hurts, even when you have to admit that you were wrong. There's a lot of freedom in just saying I was wrong. Be honest with the Lord, you know, which is the opposite of someone who lies. And if you mess up, you fess up, you take your medicine, right? You take your medicine for it, and you learn from it. And you commit in your heart that lying is not an option. Now, are there some things, now you don't write me any letters, okay? Are there some things that we shouldn't be telling our kids? Well, Greg said, you know, I gotta, can't tell them all. You know, I got to tell them all the truth. Well, Exercise some wisdom there. There are things that some children can't understand, so don't get goofy on that stuff. But, uh, but just learn to be honest with your kids. Here's a, here's a few quotes that, uh, that I found interesting. That it's simple. Never lie to someone who trusts you and never trust someone who lies. Here's another one. Hurt me with the truth, but never comfort me with a lie. There, there are way too many people pleasers in the body of Christ. That's why people like me look like the boogeyman, because I'm the guy who's willing to tell people the truth, whether they like it or not. So you guys, all, you guys need to take some of this heat off of me and just tell people the truth. 
Tell them the truth. In the long run, they'll respect you for it. But don't comfort somebody with a lie. Better be slapped with the truth than kissed with a lie. And I love this one. <laughs> when your parents accuse you of lying to them, look at them in the eye and say, Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, Tooth Fairy. Oh, I just made a whole bunch of parents mad at me. But at some point, you're going to have to tell your kids that you lied to them. Those are earthly things. Those are worldly things to teach your kids. You have an opportunity to teach them the truth. Guess what? There's no such thing as Santa. And they'll think, they'll do, Mom, I went 18 years with you telling me there was Santa. Or eight years or whatever it is. At some point, you've got to tell them the truth. Do you think they aren't thinking, what else did my parents not tell me the truth about? What else did my parents lie to me about? So I'm just saying, don't fall for it. Just tell your kids the truth. So in addition to lying to God about their covenant with Him, what else is God calling Israel out for? Look at this. Look at verse 5. The inhabitants of Samaria. We started off very slowly. We're going to end very quickly, so we're not going to be here till 9. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of Beth-Avon, for its people mourn for it, and its priests shriek for it, because its glory has departed from it. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jerob. That's not the subway guy. That's Jared. King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. In Hebrew, what does the word Beth mean? Beth. It's not just a song by Kiss from, remember that? That was 1978. You young people don't remember. Beth. It does. It means house. Either Beth, B-E-T-H, or Bet, Bet, uh, B-E-T, means house of. Like Bethlehem means, Bet means house, Lechem means bread, so house of bread. And that's why Jesus said he is the bread of, yes, he's the bread of life. So here, the Hebrew word avon means wickedness. So Beth avon means what? House of wickedness. And in this instance, it's referring to the city of what? Do you know what, what it's referring to? The city of Bethel. 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 El being the first consonant in what? Elohim. Elohim. So, Beth El means house of God, the name that Jacob gave it back in Genesis 28. What God is saying here by calling the once house of God, Beth El, now he is calling it the house of what? He's calling it the house of wickedness. It was at Bethel and Dan where Jeroboam the first set up their the twin golden calves. So God is not happy here that the house of God has now become the house of idols or the house of wickedness. Oh, and notice that their 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 God idol is now being given to who? To King Jerob as as a present. As a present. King Jerob's the king of Assyria. Once again, we get the reminder. But if your God, if, if you were able to pick up your God and move it to, a, to another location, that's not much of a God. It's time to get, it's time to get a new God. Look at, verse, look at verse 7. As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Okay. Um, how many of you grew up relatively poor, 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 poor? I didn't, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. I grew up... Uh, <laughs> which forced me to grow up with an imagination. Our family didn't have any money when I was a kid. So when other kids were out, you know, playing with their little toy boats that their parents had, had bought them, uh, my toys were birthed in, in imagination. I bet you some of you did this. After it rained, after it rained and, and water was rushing down the gutter, did you ever make a little, put a little stem in a leaf and make a little, you know, like a little stab, put a little leaf there and, and made your made your little boat, and you would, you would run down the street. Did you ever do this? Anybody ever do this? Raise your hand if you ever do this. Is it just me? All right, some of you do this. Okay. And you ran down the street. You ran down the street. And you're watching your little homemade ships run all the way down the sidewalk, watching the current sweep them away until it dumped into the sewer grate. Uh, 
Anybody ever climb into a sewer grate? Anybody ever did that? I did, yeah. If you're a boy here, <laughs> at some point you climbed into a sewer grate or something, something that you knew that you shouldn't have, right? <laughs> That's the picture that Hosea is, is painting here, that the Assyrians are going to take Israel away like a twig on the water or foam on the water. Look at verse 8. In the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to their mountains, cover us, and the hills fall on us. You understand what's going on here? They became suicidal because they knew the invasion of the Assyrians is coming. Now, those words uh, cover us and, and fall on us to the mountains, that should sound familiar. Do you remember from where? Revelation. What? Anybody remember? Extra points if you know. Give you a piece of candy after church. End of chapter 6, all right? Jeff gets candy, all right? Very good. It's the, uh, it is at the end of chapter 6. And that's exactly what happens when they realize that this is the wrath of the Lamb. They say to the mountains, fall on us and cover us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. And remember, it's talking about these, uh, these high places. These high places were often where they, would, where they would set up their pagan altars. Look at verse 9. It says, O Israel, you have, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood, the battle uh, in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. When it is my desire... I will chasten them. People shall be gathered against them when I bind them for their two, for their two transgressions. So, Gibeah was a city in the tribal territory. Anybody know? I got another piece of candy for anybody who knows what, what tribe? Benjamin, okay? Mark gets a piece of candy too. Well done. And uh, as you remember from our judges study, it wasn't that long ago, this city was just like Sodom and Gomorrah, and they had given themselves over to homosexuality and all types of sexual perversion. And so what happens? The men of the city end up raping the Levites' concubine, which sparked a civil war when the city defended the rapist. So the rest of Israel does what? Puts a beat down, and they almost destroyed the entire tribe. And once again, God is... He's long on memory, and he's patient with our sin until he's not. You know, he's patient, 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 and then he gets to that point where I'm looking down the corridor of time. This is the only way that I'm going to get Greg's attention. I have to put him flat on his back for something. Look at verse 11. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his quads. Now, again, from all my years growing up on the farm, I've trained many a heifer to thresh grain. What? Do you think that's not true? No, you'd be correct. Um, because um, it's not hard work. It's not hard work to get uh, a heifer to, to walk in, in circles and, uh, and to cut new, new furrows in the ground. The cows had, to, uh, had to, to, to plow through, well, they had to plow through very hard soil. They were utterly unhappy about that. Get it? <laughs> you knew it was coming. I know, I know, I know. Apparently, they had a beef with hard work. Get it? Beef, 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 beef. Uh, uh. One of them even started to throw a little hissy fit, so I, uh, I said, don't have a cow about it. And I know, I know, I know. Just for that, I'm going to give you one more. Maybe. One of them tried to get out of the hard work by giving me a religious exemption. You know what I said? Mm. Holy cow! Religious exemption? Anyway, what is God saying here? That it's hard. It's intensive. <laughs> Those are bad jokes. Is that what God is saying here? Yeah, he's probably saying that. Um, he's going to put them into hard, intensive, laborious work. That's going to become their norm. Look at this, verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness. 
righteousness. Reap, right? Reap and, oh, there I, oh, there I am on the farm. Forgot to tell you that. I knew that I'd put that in there. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap and, uh, most of you didn't believe that. I grew up on the farm. So every once in a while, I got to show you. That's the only one that I have that's not black and white. Okay. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You know, it, I, love, I love these portions. I mean, it's like over and over and over. There's this judge. It's depressing. It's discouraging. You're getting judgment, judgment, judgment information. And then he throws, he throws a verse like this in there. Just about every chapter of him pronouncing his righteous judgment on Israel, he gives them the antidote to the continued chastening. Here he says, Break up the fallow ground. The fallow, he's talking about the fallow ground of the heart. And how do you do that? You seek the Lord. What a merciful God we serve. So when we, when we mess up, if we, well, let me put it this way. When we mess it up, if we will fess it up, God will bless it up. How about that? See how, see how I did there? I put those three together just like kidneys up here. Two more verses and we're done. There we go. Therefore, tumult shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be plundered as Shalman plundered Beth Arbel in the day of battle, a mother dashed in pieces upon her children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness. At dawn, the king of Israel shall be cut off utterly. Can't be dogmatic on which uh, Shalman is referred to here. It might be the, the uh, Moabite king Salmanu, who was particularly cruel, possibly throwing moms and children off cliffs, dashing them in pieces. I mean, that's, this is the kind of stuff that went on. You know, this kind of stuff still goes on today against Christians in some part of the world. It's very disturbing, and, and all of this is so avoidable simply by choosing obedience. All they need to do is choose obedience. So my soundbite application of this chapter, break up the fallow ground of the heart, seek the Lord, reap, reap His, reap his mercy, reap His mercy. That's speaking to you tonight. Just get it over with. Take your medicine from the Lord and the result being reap in mercy. Here's your uh, discussion questions. Here's your discussion questions for tonight. How do you explain Israel's continued disobedience? What does it mean to have a divided heart? What are some examples? Why don't some believers take lying as serious as God does? And why are some action, uh, what are some action steps in breaking up fallow ground in our hearts? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for another, uh, this is another great study in your word. And uh, boy, I know it's discouraging hearing this kind of stuff week after week after week. But Holy Spirit, you could have just had four chapters in the book of Hosea. And after we get away from, from uh, uh Hosea and Gomer in chapter 4, you could have said, and God put the hammer down, the end. But you didn't. You want us to learn something just like you wanted Israel to learn something. And what you want us to learn, God, is that it's, it's just so wise to make you our first love and to keep you that way. And so I would pray, Lord, that we would, we would not follow in Israel's negative example, but we would follow in the example of uh, Hosea, who was even willing to marry uh, this prostitute. That is just incredible obedience. Lord, let there be great discussion in our groups tonight, and uh, help us, help us to never fall in the same trap that we see Israel in and continue in this downward spiral. Amen. Amen.